Welcome everybody who's joining us. We are just about a minute away from starting. So um, hang tight for just a moment and we will get started uh, in just one minute. All right, I think it is about time to go ahead and get started. So um, good afternoon, everyone from Chicago. Good morning to those of you that are um, on the West Coast uh, or further West. Um, welcome to the session on bilingualism. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, oh, I see, uh, Oksana, I just sent you an email just to make sure. Um, so. No worries. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. For those of you uh, that haven't attended a session before, um, the format of this is much like an in-person conference. Each presenter will have 20 minutes to make their presentation, followed by 10 minutes of questions. I'll be moderating uh, this session today. My name is Brad Hoot from uh, DePaul University in Chicago in the US. and. Um, I will be uh, sort of directing the conversation today. Uh, please go ahead, if you have questions uh, for the presenters, please put those in the chat or use the Q&A function and I will moderate the discussion afterwards for each of our presenters. And um, so without further ado, let's uh, begin with our first presenter today, uh, which is uh, your Denise Sedaris from the University of Michigan. So take it away, your Denise. Thank you, Brad. Um... Can you guys see my screen? Okay, perfect. Can you see my notes or are we good? You're good. Cool, thank you. So thank you all for joining this session. My name is Yordidi Sedaris. I'm a fifth year PhD student at the University of Michigan. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about this exploratory experiment that I conducted um, in order to test whether or not the presence of a trigger word had an effect on bilingual speakers acceptability judgment ratings of code switch sentences. So in order to do that, I'm first going to try to situate this talk under the assumption that a bilinguals two or more languages are always activated and that code switching serves as this one of few naturalistic reflections of this co-activation. I'll then talk a little bit more about this specific proposal that was set by Klein, which predicts that words with similar former meaning across the bilingual two languages have this facilitatory or triggering effect on code switch location. Then I'm going to introduce this exploratory study that I conducted to test whether or not the presence of a trigger word has an effect on the acceptability judgment ratings of code switch sentences um, in a specific group of bilinguals. And ultimately, I am reporting null results. So I offer a discussion for why these results turned out this way and maybe some future directions that um, we could go through. So yeah. So since Grosjean 2001, it's been assumed that bilinguals are naturally moving in a um, natural discourse continuum um, where that ranges from monolingual mode on one end and bilingual mode on the other end. So bilinguals will typically situate themselves somewhere along this continuum, depending on various factors, which include, but are not limited to, the interlocutors that they're talking to. So for example, a bilingual who has knowledge of language A and B will typically situate themselves in monolingual mode when they're engaging with an interlocutor who shares knowledge of language A, but not B. But then they will engage more with, um, in bilingual mode with interlocutors who have knowledge of both languages A and B. What's assumed is that the comparative level of activation between a bilingual's languages can actually change at any point in this discourse, but that neither one of these languages is ever turned off and work within lexical processing actually 
corroborates this assumption by showing that even in instances where bilinguals are put in, exper in experimental design and asked to either listen, read, um, speak one of their languages, the other language is still activated. Code switching then, within discourse code switching then, serves as one of these few naturalistic reflections, at least in production, of this co-activation. So code switching is this conversational method that is utilized by bilinguals where they switch back and forth between their languages within the same conversation. At the sentential level, a code switch can occur either across sentential boundaries, which is termed as intersentential code switching. And you can see this in one where we have two clauses that are conjoined together by a conjunction. And it starts off in Arabic and then it ends in English. A code switch can also occur within the same sentence called intrasentential code switching. And you can see this in two where the code switch location is actually occurring within the VP right, before, uh, right between the verb and the um, direct object. And once again, this code switch is going from Arabic into English. And I just have transliterations without the Arabic script because it's less confusing that way. Because code switching phenomena generally positions itself at the interface of various subfields, work on code switching is very highly interdisciplinary. So many proposals have approached it from across various subfields. The proposal that I'm looking at specifically today was proposed by um, Klein, which noticed that there was an above chance tendency for code switch locations to occur near words that have the same form and meaning in the uh, bilinguals two languages. So he noticed that this above chance tendency for code switch locations to occur um, within trigger words, so words that have the same form and meaning in, across the bilinguals two languages, and assumed that these words are actually not just belonging to either one of the bilinguals languages, but are shared across both languages. Klein proposed that trigger words actually have a facilitatory effect on code switch locations. And this means that bilinguals would be more likely to code switch either right before a trigger word, which he termed as anticipational triggering. And an example of this can be seen in three, which is an English into Arabic code switch, where the code switch location occurs right before the trigger word, television. Or bilingual would also be more likely to code switch right after a trigger word, as seen in four, which is an Arabic into English code switch, where the code switch location actually is occurring right after the trigger word, el television. And then applying this prediction to other psycholinguistic models of production, this has been found to actually be statistically more likely. So it's um, Borisma Debat and Borisma 2009 found that it was statistically more likely for the presence for a code switch to occur within the presence of a trigger word. And this wasn't actually limited to just the words that were directly adjacent to the code switch location, but also close enough to code switch locations. So these results are really influential in discussing the effects that trigger words have on already produced code switch utterances. And for me, in order to get a fuller picture for how trigger words affect the processing of code switch sentences in general, I'm supplementing these results of corpus analyses with an exploratory experiment. In this study, what I really tried to do was test whether or not this facilitatory effect of trigger words on code switch location that has been found in bilingual corpora translated into higher acceptability judgment scores. So mainly I was looking to see if the presence of a trigger word um, would make already grammatical code switches more acceptable, or if the presence of a trigger word would somehow have an ameliorating effect on ungrammatical code switches. So to do this, I administered an acceptability judgment task using a two by two factorial design where grammaticality of code switch, which I obtained from a different study, served as the first factor while the presence of trigger words served as the second factor. In a previous study that I had conducted, I was looking at code switching within various member, various locations in two membered construct state nominals. So the construct state is the syntactic noun phrase that's found primarily in Semitic languages, and it consists of at least two nominal members that are in a genitive relationship. This can be seen in five, where the construct state is the shoe of the actress, Gazmet el-Momasela. 
And there are three noble, notable properties about the construct state nominals, which make them a pretty rich domain, in my opinion, for investigating the syntax phonology interface, especially within code switching. The first property is the linear order of construct state nominals. So on the surface, a construct state nominal follows a possessed possessor linear order, where the possessed nominal is linearly preceding the possessor phrase. It's strict adjacency. So construct states require strict adjacency between the possessed and possessor elements. So you cannot have like a preposition in between those to mark the genitive relationship and you can't have any adjectives separating the possessed and possessor nominal. And it's word-like properties. So although the construct state is a phrase and it's a um, productive phrase, the construct state acts as one prosodic unit and has word-like properties. In this previous experiment, I reported on acceptability judgment um, scores of Egyptian Arabic English bilinguals, where they were asked to listen to various code switch sentences and then rate their acceptability on a seven point Likert scale. In this experiment, I used a two by three design where direction of code switch served as the first factor and then location of code switch served as the second factor. What I mean by that is that a code switch could either have been an Arabic into English code switch, so it could have started off in Arabic and then switched into English, or it could have been in English into Arabic code switch. And then the location of the code switch really varied on depending on where the code switch occurred with respect to the construct state. So sometimes the code switch would occur right outside of the construct state, or it would occur between the definiteness marker and the possessor nominal or it would occur between the possessed nominal and the possessor phrase. And then same for the factors where the code switch was from English into Arabic. In this study, what I had found was that regardless of code switch direction, code switching anywhere inside of the construct state, so these four factors, were rated as being significantly less acceptable than code switching outside of the construct state so these two factors. So from the results of these experiment, I labeled the ones in blue as my, so example sentences as the ones in blue where the code switching occurred outside of the construct state as my grammatical factors, whereas the examples such as in red, where code switching occurred within the construct state, I'm labeling them as the ungrammatical factors for this specific study. So here, um, once again, just like I reiterate, like I said in the previous slide, the grammatical code switches were the ones where the code switch location occurred outside of the construct state, and then the ungrammatical ones where the code switch location occurred um, within the construct state. And then the second factor for this was the presence or absence of a trigger word. In this experiment, all code switch sentences started in Arabic and ended in English and trigger words only ever appeared as the possessed nominal in the construct state nominals. So I was only looking at consequential triggering. For this experiment, 25 self-reported Egyptian Arabic English bilinguals were recruited and participants ranged from the ages of 18 to 34. All the participants had been exposed to Egyptian Arabic from birth and they were exposed to English before the age of nine. And they checked yes when asked whether or not they identified as code switchers. And participants in a post experiment questionnaire actually indicated that they were more dominant in English than they were in Egyptian Arabic. The critical stimuli for the experiment consisted of 16 sets of code switch sentences following the sample stimuli. Um, each participant saw 16 items that were counterbalanced across four lists so that participants only saw one version of each target item. And then 24 code switched filler items that were of comparable length and varying acceptability were randomly interspersed with the 16 target items for a total of 40 items. So each participants gave a one to seven Likert scale judgment for 40 code switch sentences. All sentences were recording by, recorded by a young female speaker of Egyptian, Arabic, and um, English through PRA, and then they were converted to MP3 audio files in order to be distributed as a Qualtrics survey. 
This experiment was administered completely online via Qualtrics survey, and um, we followed um, me and Savi's best practices for recording and distributing audio stimuli. And participants were um, instructed to listen to code switch sentences and rate their acceptability of the sentences on a seven point Likert scale. But before they began the experiment, they were also provided with detailed instructions to illustrate that these sentences were not to be rated based on like prescriptive norms or plausibility of event, uh, event or things of that sort. And then after completing the experiment, participants filled out a questionnaire about their language use and background of both Egyptian, Arabic, and English. The, when I came to analyze the data, the raw judgment scores, including both the target and fillers, were first converted into z-scores within participants in order to correct for the possibility that individual participants might treat the scale differently. Um, and then a linear mixed effects model was run in the R environment using grammaticality and trigger word presence as fixed effects and the participant as item and item as random effects. So these are the results. And what I found was that sentences where the code switch occurred within the construct state nominal, so these ungrammatical sentences, were rated as being less acceptable than sentences where the code switch occurred outside of the construct state nominal, the grammatical sentences, but that sentences with trigger words received similar acceptability ratings as their counterpart code switch sentences without trigger words. And then when we ran the linear mixed effects model on it, we found that there was a significant a main effect for grammaticality of code switch, but no significant effect for the presence or absence of a trigger word. So from that, I say that these results indicate that while participants were sensitive to the location of a code switch, so they rated these ungrammatical ones as being significantly less acceptable than the grammatical ones, the ratings were insensitive to the presence of a trigger word in both conditions. And so although I am reporting on null effect, like on all results here, and it seems that they might not, these bilingual speakers might not actually be sensitive to the presence of trigger words, at least in this offline acceptability task, or offline processing. Um, I don't think that these results necessarily conclude that trigger words have no processing effect on code switch. So one of the assumptions that I made is that acceptability judgment tasks would translate, higher acceptability judgment tasks would translate this facilitatory effect. But perhaps um, my, my choice task need needs to be a little bit more fine grained than a Likert scale in order to detect a difference. So probably a forced choice task would be a better task to have used in this or a speeded acceptability judgment task. So my participants were able to listen to the sentences as many times as they wanted to before making a judgment on it. So perhaps a speeded acceptability judgment task would have gotten this more fine grained um, detection or a forced choice task or an online um, measure as well. Speaker population also could have contributed to the results in this experiment. So um, when I gave you all this profile of the participants who had um, participated in this experiment, all of them had been exposed to English before the age of nine and Air Egyptian Arabic between um, from birth. And they kind of fall more under the umbrella of being heritage speakers. So possibly um, speakers with different acquisition paths could give us a more full picture of this. Also, this experiment only looked at consequential triggering. So perhaps um, anticipational triggering could have done different effects. Um, and that's something that I'm actually currently working on right now to see whether or not there's a difference between consequential and anticipational triggering. That is it. So here are some references. Um, thank you so much to the bilingual community, especially the ones in Columbus, Ohio that participated on the experiments reported here. And especially to Higaman Sedera Sederis for making this community possible and something that um, I can be part of and work with. And I'm also really thankful to Emily Merlis, Savi, and Acrisio, and the Simpson Discussion Group for many, many helpful comments. And then all errors are definitely my own. Thank you all. Wonderful. Thank you very much, your Denise. Um, 
Uh, so now is the time for questions. We've got about 10 minutes for questions and uh, discussion. As I mentioned at the beginning, just to reiterate quickly for those who may have joined late, I'll be moderating the discussion. Uh, questions should be posed, please, during uh, through the Zoom chat feature or through the Q&A feature. I think the Q&A feature is actually even better, um, but either way will work and I will be happy to moderate that. Um, a couple notes real quick about the questions, if you would, uh, if possible, I forgot to mention this earlier, but as you write your question, if you would identify yourself, your name, institution, and pronouns, that would be helpful. Additionally, I just wanted to note um, that this Q&A time is for thoughtful questioning and for drawing out new ahas about the work, not obviously for combat. Um, it, <laughs> we should make sure that all questions are really questions and not a speech, uh, and ideally keep the question and answer short enough that others also have a turn and limit follow-up for the same reason. Finally, uh, just to note that a good question of this uh, sort mentions something positive about the talk and then opens up an illuminating uh, different way of looking at things such as new data, ideas, uh, and uh, other ways. So let's go ahead and get started with that. Please again, write your questions in those two places. The first question that we got um, was from uh, Gu Wan Li who asks, could we look at the trigger words that were used in the experiment um, and uh, how were any lexical properties controlled for? Thank you for bringing that up. That's actually the same question that my advisor brought up, which is something that is also a um, follow-up study that I didn't put in here, but could be a future direction as well. Um, the trigger words that I used, so Klein had a, um, a bunch of words could have fallen under this umbrella of trigger words. And since I was using heritage speakers as um, my main participants in this experiment, I opted more for borrowed words. So words that were borrowed from English into Arabic specifically, and so had high frequency in their usage in Arabic. Um, I think that looking at words that might have had more of like a historical um, like cognate words that more had more like a historical connection to each other or different kinds of trigger words is actually very important to see that. And in my model, I made um, items as random. So I didn't actually look at the specific items or how things would have been different. But yeah, that's definitely something that should be followed up on. Great, thank you. Um, there's one other uh, question that's come in, but before we change topics, if you don't mind, uh, since I haven't, uh, there's only just the one pending, I had a question about the same topic before we move on. Cool. With regard to those trigger words, uh, my question is, do, how, what was their, since this was oral stimuli, how were they pronounced? I imagine that, that jacket, the way that I just said it, is not how Arabic speakers pronounce it. So how did you deal with that? Yeah, so actually the young female speaker who recorded these is me, but it's always weird to say like, oh, I recorded these. Um, I tried to keep the prosody of it um, as consistent, well, the pronunciations and prosody of it as consistent in Arabic as possible, and the prosody of the whole sentence as consistent across items as possible. And I do have those charts somewhere if anyone's interested in seeing them. Um, but I would pronounce things like, um, Sorry, let me go back to the example. Like, jacket in Momasila instead of jacket in Momasila. So I would pronounce it as Arabic as possible. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we have another question uh, from uh, Gu Wan Li, uh, who asks, do you think this phenomenon of triggering might be expanded into different linguistic realms, such as syntactic structure, prosody, or other areas? Yes, sorry, I think I just lost my, can you guys see my screen still or no? We cannot. Oh, okay. All right. I don't know what happened there. Um, actually, yeah. So I, I actually forget who did this, but there was a study that looked at whether or not the presence of a trigger word had more of an effect on syntactic priming. And they found that although there was like a high core, like it was higher of an effect to syntactically prime something, a code switch right after a trigger word, it wasn't significant. So yeah, it, it might have an effect as well, um, but detecting the effects of trigger words has been very like, the, the task needs to be very um, specific, I think, in my opinion, and it has to get these really fine grained um, effects. 
I hope that answered your question. If not, please email me and we can definitely chat about it. <laughs> sure, yeah, or um, uh, Gyuhan, please, you're welcome also to, to add a follow-up into the chat or something if you'd like. Um, all right, uh, a couple other, any other questions? I haven't seen any other questions coming in, but I do have another one if, if nobody else does and they don't mind. Um, so one question I had about this, is there any variation in Arabic with these kinds of structures that could oh, yeah. potentially play a role? Um, or is there a, um, uh, is there, uh, or is like, is, is that any, is that a possible, is there any possible effect of that in here? Oh yeah, the construct state definitely, so the construct state nominal specifically definitely has variation across the dialects of Arabic. So, and some um, dialects of Arabic, it's been, we they moved more towards a paraphrastic construction using a prepositional phrase um, rather than using this construct state nominal. And yeah, there's definitely variation across the different um, dialects of Arabic. I focused mainly on the Egyptian variety of it. So I tried to, instead of treating um, all Egypt Arabic English speakers as like a monolith, I tried to definitely restrict them to um, a community that I know had a similar kind of acquisition path with similar kind of input and um, with the phrase, the, a similar input, at least with this specific phrase. But yeah. Um, I think Sarah has a question and she's here in the, yeah, right in the video here. Yeah. So Sarah, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and just ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't want to Oh, now we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. OK, cool. Um, so thank you for the talk. I'm actually highly interested in this as someone who also looks at uh, code switches that concern nominal phrases um, or in your state construct, construct state nominals. Um, and so I'm curious if you've also thought about looking at what types of syntactic structures are actually preceding or following these construct state nominals and seeing if you find differences and whether or not um, you know, your participants, uh, how they evaluated those sentences. Yes, so um, I haven't done more on that, but specifically for these items, um, what I tried to do is make all sentences SVO and they all had a subject, verb, object, mainly just transitive sentences, and then some kind of adverbial phrase. And that was the pattern that went pretty much throughout most of the stimuli so that the syntactic structure, so that like the, sim the stimuli sentences and things like that would be as, as consistent as possible. But is there something else specifically that you had in mind, like different things? No, I was just more so curious if whether or not those construct state nominals would occur in subject versus object position and maybe there would be oh, yeah. some differences depending on where they occurred. Just yeah. for the fact that um, some of the work that I've been looking at recently, um, which involves switches within determiner phrases, have found that bilinguals do treat these very differently, at least using um, eye tracking and reaction times, um, which is a, an alternative so if you want to chat about those alternative ways. We should definitely chat about that. Yeah, <laughs> they were all in object position here if you're interested, but we should definitely chat about that. <laughs> all right. Um, I think that we have answered all of the questions that have come in so far. So if anybody has, we've got just a couple minutes left. If anybody has one uh, more follow-up uh, or... All right. Um, can I just ask a question out of curiosity then if nobody hasn't, this is not so much about triggering as much as about the preliminary study where you establish the grammaticality, ungrammaticality. Basically you find that switches inside these nominal constructions are bad, right? Yeah. Um, do you have any idea why that might be the case? Because we know that people in other language pairs can switch inside, like nominal constructions in general are not impossible to switch within, right? Um, but we know there are like specific things that that can sometimes cause them to be bad. So do you have a sense of what is going on there? Yeah, so in that paper, I actually argue it's because of the word like properties. I think that the extension, we should extend the ban on word, um, the ban on, what's it called? Um, 
word so code switching mm -hmm. within words the word internal ban on code switching mm -hmm. to the construct state because of its word like properties yeah. and that's actually the reason why i think the code switches are not possible it well are not as acceptable within sure. these construct states but i do have a preprint of that paper if anyone is interested i'd be more than willing to send it over I, yeah, I'd be interested to see, because I, I think that's a really interesting idea. And it's also interesting because it seems like here, it doesn't like the triggering words aren't enough to overcome that ban, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, that's very cool. Um, all right, great. Well, thank you very much, your Denise. Um, thank you for that presentation. We are just about at the time that we should move on to our second uh, presenter. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, do that as well. Um, so uh, we will welcome now uh, Julia Nee, who is coming to us from the University of California, Berkeley, um, and who is going to uh, talk to us about uh, language revitalization camps and long format audio recordings. So take it away, Julia. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, let me just get this in presenter view. All right, so are we seeing my slide? Okay, great. Um, and then let me just make sure that we can great hear my audio. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much um, for being here with me. Today, I'll be talking about measuring the effects of language revitalization using long format audio recordings. And I hope that I can answer the question of what the language of emergent Spanish Zapotec bilingual sounds like in Teotihuacan del Valle, Mexico. Before we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the Ohlone people on whose traditional ancestral and unceded land I currently reside and whose historical relationships with that land continue to the present day. And I'm also thankful to present this work, which the research for which was carried out on both Ohlone and Zapotec lands. So today, like I said, um, I hope to look um, at how we can measure the effects of language revitalization using long format speech environment recordings. I think that this can be useful because we know that one of the key elements for sustainable language revitalization is the reestablishment of intergenerational language transmission. However, determining the extent to which this intergenerational language use is occurring can be really difficult. Self reports of language use can often be inaccurate and researcher observations can introduce a possible observer's paradox. For this reason, long format speech environment recordings um, might be a useful tool. They've proven useful in understanding participants natural language use in a lot of other environments. And today um, we will uh, examine what can be learned from this type of recording of Zapotec learners ages 6 through 12 in Teotihuacan del Valle, Mexico. I hope uh, today that uh, uh, we can see as well that while this is very promising, um, there are also some significant methodological challenges um, in collecting this type of data from children in this age range. Um, and it results in very different types of data than we normally would expect um, with LFSE. I'll argue today that this data is still valuable for understanding how language might be used, especially when we pair it with other types of data. It's also valuable for assessing language proficiency, um, and I find it valuable for documenting language and use, as well as documentation that has an eye towards revitalization. Um, if families are interested in restarting intergenerational um, language transmission, having recordings of how parents and children interact in Zapotec can be extremely valuable. So today I hope to argue that in Teotitlan, long format speech environment recordings allowed learners to showcase the range of their language skills in an environment where they felt comfortable. And it also provided a fuller picture of learners Zapotec language abilities. So today I hope to answer three questions. First, I'll highlight some of the methodological challenges that were presented in collecting this type of data from children in this age range. I'll also address what these recordings suggest about children's language use in Teotitlan as well as what these recordings suggest about the efficacy of the language revitalization camps. Before we dive into those three questions, I want to present a brief overview of Teotitlan del Valle Zapotec. Um, this is an Otomangayan language that is uh, also a variety of Western Tlacolula Valley Zapotec. It's spoken by about 3,600 people in Teotitlan, which has a total population of about 5,500. Um, it's spoken where this green dot is here in Southern Mexico. According to UNESCO, the language is definitely endangered. Children are using more Spanish than Zapotec nowadays, um, and they are increasingly monolingual Spanish speakers. So we're seeing some significant language shift from Zapotec to Spanish. 
At the same time, I want to highlight that there are a wide range of language revitalization initiatives currently in place, um, and we see a lot of Zapotec language use and Zapotec language learning. However, when this particular project began in 2017, there were no initiatives that specifically targeted uh, elementary school students. And for this reason, I worked together with Rosita Jimenez Lorenzo to design Zapotec workshops for kids ages four through 16. Um, these were hosted sort of like summer camps um, in the summer and the winter. They had this structure of being approximately two hours a day, Monday through Friday for two to three weeks, depending on student schedules. We spent about half of the time um, engaging in classroom instruction with the goal of familiarizing children with Zapotec and helping them become comfortable using the language. And then we took the kids on field trips throughout the community where they could speak with native Zapotec speakers um, and hopefully encourage them to continue the Zapotec language learning throughout the year and not just during the workshops. As part of this, we also collected um, LFSE from 10 workshop participants. Um, so now I'd like to talk a bit more about the methodology of how that data was collected. So um, 10 participants ages 6 through 12 who were involved in the workshops um, agreed to participate in the study. Everyone was invited, um, but 10 joined. The median age of these participants was 10 and a half, and this included four female participants and six male participants. And these represent six households, um, and I'll also note five homesteads as two of these households share the same communal courtyard. So children were asked to wear um, these special t-shirts, which you can see um, the child on the left is wearing this white t-shirt, and there's this yellow pocket in the center of it um, where the child can insert a small audio recorder. Um, and they're asked to wear this t-shirt and record sort of all of their waking hours um, that they feel comfortable recording. They were invited to record two days before or during the Zapotec workshops and two days after the workshops. Um, ideally, this would have been a pre-test post-test design with two days before and two days after, but I recruited participants through the workshops. So some students joined the study once the workshops had already begun. So I wanna highlight some of the benefits of this type of data and also some of the challenges. Um, obviously, we're hoping to record a more naturalistic environment uh, where participants are ideally not focused on the recording. And this is useful because it documents key aspects of language socialization and use that are not typically part of documentation projects, but as I mentioned before, are extremely important for future language revitalization projects. Some challenges that we face um, I think this age range is really interesting because these children are old enough to understand that they're being recorded. So this is very different from these early um, first language acquisition studies where babies don't understand that they're being recorded. But unlike adults who might participate in this type of study, the kids aren't quite able to understand the full purpose of research and of this particular research study. Um, and they don't always feel secure that their recordings will be private. Um, this results in some self-consciousness um, to the point that it affected recording quantity and quality. So some students felt very uncomfortable recording a lot of their naturalistic interactions and um, they were shown how to start and stop the recorder. So they started and stopped frequently. Um, and then some participants asked for things to be erased as well. And I of course honored those requests. Um, the quality is also affected as um, some students really liked wearing the t-shirts and wore them all day and other students didn't feel so cool wearing the t-shirts and instead carried the recorder around in a purse or wearing their own t-shirt or in their hand. Um, and again, I prioritize the comfort um, of participants. And so we have some interesting recordings. Um, and this is also complicated by the relationship that I have between with the participants as both a researcher and a Zapotec uh, teacher. So we'll see some of those effects um, in the data. So I wanna highlight um, one main consequence of these complications, which is that two types of recordings were collected. Um, and I'm gonna call them long and short recordings. So these long recordings are sort of your more typical LFSE data. These are longer uninterrupted recording times, anything from 10 minutes to a couple of hours in length. They feature less speech from the participant and generally less attention is being paid to the recording device. We also have a series of short recordings, um, and these are very short recordings. Um, some of them can be as little as a few seconds. Some of them are much longer, um, but they're almost exclusively participant speech um, or speech between the study participants who are speaking together. Um, and as we'll get to hear, these are quite performative in nature. Um, so I want to um, talk about these two different types of recordings um, one by one. And first, we'll focus on a quick quantitative analysis of the long recordings. So to analyze these quantitatively, I sampled five second segments from each minute for all recordings that were over 10 minutes in length and where I was not present in the recording. 
Um, I tagged the clips as being speech or non-speech and then annotated who was speaking and what language they were using. This resulted in 1,676 total clips, um, including 784 speech clips. So I'm going to show data for six participants that represent the six different households because within the household, we tended to get identical recordings from two siblings who were doing things together. So I'll just report on one from each household. Um, so a couple of things that I wanted to highlight. Um, first of all, I just wanted us to note sort of differences in comfort level with recordings. Um, participants like Danielle um, recorded significantly more than participants like Leonardo. Um, so this reflects some of those complications I had mentioned before. I also want to highlight that most of the participants were not speaking Zapotec the majority of the time. There's definitely Spanish dominance here, the one exception being Osvaldo, um, who mostly is speaking Zapotec, but also um, qualitatively, his long recordings are more performative in nature than some of the other long recordings. I think it's also really notable that there's very little use of Zapotec between children. And I think that this is really significant for language revitalization, because if we want to have sustainable language revitalization, um, we probably want to have children speaking in Zapotec with one another. So let's look at these recordings um, qualitatively as well. Um, so I just wanna highlight some of the things that we're able to hear in these longer recordings. Um, so children are often present as active overhearers of speech between adults, um, and we can hear the children engaging through their agreement and disagreement, um, but they're not producing a lot of substantive language um, during these portions of the recordings. So kids are hearing um, and agreeing, disagreeing with a lot of Zapotec and bilingual conversation between adults. Um, we got some monolingual Spanish adult conversations on the recordings, um, but not as much, um, and they were mostly at uh, one particular event which was held outside of the home. So the language within the home is mostly Zapotec or bilingual. There's also child-directed speech in both languages. Parents use both Zapotec and Spanish um, with their children, and the children overwhelmingly respond in Spanish. However, I want to note that if a child initiated a conversation with an adult in Zapotec, in all of the instances um, that I was able to find on the recordings, they got a response in Zapotec from their parents. So I think, again, this is really important for language revitalization um, to see how we might promote these sorts of Zapotec child initiations that could then allow the child to really practice their Zapotec skills and get more Zapotec language input from adults in their environment. Um, we also were able to see some instances of parents actively teaching Zapotec to their children um, and also um, teaching them ideas about Zapotec. Um, so we have instances of parents explaining the importance of the Zapotec language to their children, including one parent who asked their child to repeat the phrase, I like to learn Zapotec because I'm from Teotihuacan in Zapotec. Um, so we can definitely see the types of language attitudes and values that parents are promoting with their children. I also wanted to highlight a few examples where learners are not fully fluent in Zapotec, but they do the best that they can to use Zapotec in order to um, get adults to respond with Zapotec and sort of keep the conversation going in Zapotec. Um, so I have two examples here. Um, in the first example, um, I should note the regular font is Spanish and the italics is Zapotec. So in this first example, um, the child says to their parent, me costó diner, where diner is a uh, Zapotec phonologization of the Spanish word dinero for money. Um, and as a result of saying this, um, the adult who very frequently speaks with this child in Spanish um, responds in Zapotec and says, oh, why don't you use the Zapotec word made? So um, even though this utterance is, is mostly Spanish, um, by attempting the Zapotec, the child is able to get more Zapotec input. Similarly, in the second example, um, an adult is speaking in Zapotec to another child, and the child uses a code switch in order to keep the conversation going in Zapotec. So the child um, is not able to say in Zapotec with a green uniform and instead says it in Spanish, uh, con uniforme verde, um, and then repeats but replaces verde, green, with the Zapotec word bishui, green. Um, and then the conversation with the parent continues in Zapotec. And I think this is really important because in many other cases where an adult is speaking in Zapotec, once the child speaks in Spanish, responses from the parent are then also in Spanish. So by using this word bishui, the conversation continues in Zapotec. 
So that's sort of a qualitative analysis of these long recordings. Um, just so we can get a sense of the difference between the recordings, I want to play a very short um, snippet of a long recording and then some of the short recordings. So let's listen um, to this long recording. Whoop. Okay, let's see. <laughs> Okay, so I hope what we heard there was silence, <laughs> um, background noise, uh, foreground noise of toys, and then we hear some utterances from children, right? So it's kind of messy, naturalistic data. On the other hand, we have some short recordings that I think you will agree are a bit more performative in nature. Um, so let me first share this song, which some of you might recognize from a Disney movie. Banana. 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 Um, so I don't know if anyone was able to hear, this is a Zapotec cover of the song Remember Me from Coco. Um, so here, these two children are very clearly singing for the recorder, right? They're performing the song, um, and in other recordings, we hear them rehearsing the song and recording it over and over until they're satisfied. Um, so more performative in nature. We also see this with monologues. Um, I picked this clip because I think it is convincingly performative as it begins with the phrase, take two. Um, so this child is performing for the recorder and we'll also see that in the content, um, he's commenting on my role as teacher. So let's just have a listen there. Segun, segunda toma. <coughs> maestra, maestra Julian, eh, Rului, Ruluyan, Chulmate Ruluyan. So he's clearly um, taking pauses and just sort of trying to rehearse his Zapotec. Um, we also see examples where participants are repeating words, sort of like repeating word lists from domains like colors, animals, verbs, the type of things that we cover in class. And then we also see some dialogues that look a lot like the types of dialogues you might have in a foreign language class. So um, I would also like to play this clip um, where we have a conversation between Leo and Hisel. And I want us to note how when Leo does not know how to respond in Zapotec, Mario helps him out a little bit. So um, let's listen there. Sayu. Cuenca. Lo diga. Sayu. Cuenca. Se llevó tu la manzana. Lo diga. Se callao. Que chidi. Okay, so it's probably hard to hear the whispering, but we see the sort of helping is being given for this performance. So I want to compare these observed um, language use with reported language use. So first of all, there's wide variation between the recordings, LFSE recordings, and reported language use, including generally underreported exposure to Zapotec. Five out of six participants and their parents reported less exposure to Zapotec um, than we actually observed. Um, in one case, however, um, Giselle and her parent both reported uh, Zapotec dominance for her in both hearing and speaking. Um, however, in her observed speech, she's only using Zapotec 22% of the time. And I think this is really significant because um, in the recordings, Giselle demonstrates creative use of fluent Zapotec. She is a fluent Zapotec speaker. Um, and I think that what this shows us is that increasing Zapotec language use is gonna require more than simply teaching children the language. Giselle speaks Zapotec. Um, however, we still see her using a lot of Spanish. And so I think what we also need to do is foster environments where children feel comfortable actually using the language. I also wanna highlight that these differences could certainly be due to sample bias in the recordings, as well as inaccuracies in self-reports. So there's more investigation to be done here. We can also compare this with um, my observations of classroom language use. So some participants showed much greater Zapotec fluency in the LFSE recordings than they use in the classroom. Um, some incorporated vocabulary and grammatical structures that are related, but not um, specifically things that we covered in the course. And um, some participants also use some of the methods that Rosita and I model in the classroom to help with um, ongoing learning. So things like asking questions in Zapotec instead of Spanish, and then using code switching to rely on any Zapotec linguistic resources that children have at their disposal. 
We can also look at recordings before and after the camp to see if any learning has taken place. Um, five out of the 10 participants created recordings both before and after the language revitalization camp. This includes one participant who speaks in Zapotec with their parent only after the camp. Um, and this parent also notes that her child has a greatly increased interest in Zapotec in my one-on-one -on -one interview with her um, following the camp. This child also switches from using Spanish to ask questions in the before recordings to using Zapotec questions like Shur um, in the after recordings. We also have lots of recordings of children um, singing Zapotec songs that have been covered in the course. Um, and one participant in particular shows a greater diversity of content in the performative recordings after the camp. At the same time, the lack of data here make it difficult to say definitively what impacts the camp has had on participants, but I think that the performative data show that learners are bringing elements of the classroom, like songs, vocabulary, and questions. They're bringing these things home, and they're also showing some interest in continuing to speak Zapotec. So what can we learn from these LFSE recordings of kids? Um, I hope that we've been able to see that there are some unique challenges in working with kids age 6 through 12 that have resulted in atypical LFSE data. I think these data are still useful and they suggest that Zapotec learners are more proficient than they often report, than their parents often report, and than they demonstrate in the classroom. I think that they show that if the goal is to increase Zapotec language use among children, it's about more than simply teaching children the language. Children have this deeper knowledge um, and they still need to be encouraged in order to use the language in their day-to-day -day lives. I think that these LFSE recordings were useful in providing an environment where children felt more comfortable speaking in Zapotec, and this allows us to more fully understand their language abilities, and it also helps us to document how children and families use language in Teotihuacan. While LFSE did not give us a clear picture of language use, it did contribute to a clearer picture alongside other measures. It suggested which aspects of the language workshops are being taken up by participants at home, and it has reinforced the centrality of not just language teaching, but creating comfortable spaces for learners to use their growing language skills. Thank you for listening to this presentation, and thank you as well to all of the people who made this research possible. Wonderful. That was a delightful presentation. Thank you very much, Julia. Uh, every Any presentation with recordings of kids uh, is always fun. Um, so uh, it is now time for questions for those of you uh, that might be joining us new. Uh, I wanted to reiterate that uh, I'll be moderating the questions, so please put those in the uh, question and the answer tool. Um, or if you can't do that, you can put them in the chat. Uh, when you do, please identify yourself, name, institution, and pronouns. Uh, and remember that uh, Q&A is for thoughtful questioning and for drawing out new ahas, uh, making sure that your questions are short and uh, really a question, and limiting follow-ups uh, to let everybody have a turn. Uh, and a good question mentions something positive about the talk and then opens up illuminating new ways of thinking about things. So um, we are open for questions right now. We've got about eight minutes. Could any, uh, if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and type those up. Um, well, while you while we're waiting for questions to come in, if you don't mind, Julia, I have a couple um, things that I was wondering about. Um, one thing that I was wondering about is it seemed like you were mostly encountering um, really positive language attitudes towards Zapotec in the recordings that you get. Do you have any evidence of anti, uh, you know, because they're not using a huge amount of Zapotec, so mm -hmm. then uh, presumably there are pressures against its use. Did you find evidence in the recordings of those pressures being brought to bear on kids? And yeah, could you talk a little bit about community support and resistance more broadly? Yeah, absolutely. So I think these recordings don't have a lot of evidence um, that speaks to that point, but I think sort of if we consider the other types of data that I've also collected as part of this project, I think the biggest force against Zapotec language use that we have is sort of fear from children, um, that there's a lot of questions of language and identity that are linked together um, for these Zapotec children. And there have been instances sort of of prescriptivism, um, especially with older speakers in the community about what counts as Zapotec um, and what is good Zapotec. And children who are learning Zapotec are sometimes not given the most positive feedback by elders in their community um, if they are trying Zapotec. And of course, when you're learning a language, you will make mistakes and you will sometimes say things wrong. Um, but 
because of this really tight connection between language and identity, especially in an indigenous language context, just the stakes are really high for kids. And I think that this leads to a lot of sort of suppression of language use because I've seen a lot of instances basically where if children speak Spanish, their identity as Zapotec is not really called into question. Um, but then if they do speak Zapotec and they don't speak Zapotec perfectly, it sort of opens an opportunity for someone to say, I mean, I have heard things like, how can you call yourself Zapotec if that's the way you use the language, right? So like it gets very wow. real, very fast. Yeah. Um, and so I think these fears are sort of what lead children to say, well, it's, it's a little bit less risky if I just stick with Spanish. Interesting. That's yeah. wow. That's a really that's very interesting. <laughs> I uh, that's like you watching like prescriptivism do actual damage to kids like in real time. Um, yeah, and I, I think the I, I should also say like I don't think people have negative intentions when they say these comments. Sure. It's out of a real concern for the language, right, and a concern for preserving tradition. Um, and and that's very real as well. It's just mm -hmm. it's it's a tough environment to be in sometimes for kids. I think. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from uh, Stephanie de la Porta who asks, who says, great presentation, and then asks, do you think that having the children listen to their recordings over time, showing their progress, uh, would be encouraging for them to continue with the language? Oh, that's such an interesting question. I hadn't thought about that, but I would guess that the answer is yes. Um, in fact, I should have played some of these clips. There are actually um, recordings. So in the families where there's multiple kids participating, there's recordings of kids playing the recordings from the other recorder. Um, so they're actually already listening to their own recordings and listening to their own progress. But um, I think that if we did this sort of more, yeah, in a more facilitated way, that also might really encourage their learning. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Uh, another question came in uh, from uh, Meg C. Koch from the University of Maryland, which uh, who uses she, her, and um, she says, thanks, Julia. I found it very interesting that the kids showed greater fluency in the recordings than during the camps. Do you mm -hmm. attribute that to negative language attitudes that the children and their parents experience or experienced at school? Or are there other causes of the discrepancy that are particular to this community? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I should also shout out a thanks to Meg, who um, was at UC Berkeley before and helped me with the methodology for this study. Um, so yeah, responding to that question, um, I think that it does have a lot to do with the negative language ideologies. And basically, in the classroom, even though I think it's, it's a lower stakes environment than out in the community speaking with um, elders, but it's still higher stakes than being alone with the recorder in your own home. Um, and they also like they can delete the recordings that they don't like, like it's very low stakes in the recordings. So I think they really take bigger risks than they do even in the classroom. Um, so I think that that the attitudes have a lot to do with it. Great, thank you. Um, we've still got four more minutes, so anybody who has another question, please go ahead and uh, throw that up there. In the meantime, I have a couple other things also that I was wondering about. Um, you talked some about the direct about the variance in reporting, self reports of Zapotec language use and proficiency compared to what you actually observe in the recordings. One thing that wasn't completely clear to me is: is there a like a, a, con, a constant directionality, like they're always under reporting their Zapotec proficiency in use, or is it mixed? Sometimes they're over reporting. And could you talk about if you have any ideas about why that might exist? Yeah, so um, in five out of the six um, cases that I reported in this study, the Zapotec use was under reported in comparison with the observed recordings. And then there was the one case where it was over reported. I think it's over reported in the one case because um, in, within this household, it's definitely a Zapotec dominant household. Um, and so I think the parents there have a perception that their children are Zapotec dominant speakers. Um, although, given what children are actually doing during their day, they're often talking with other kids who don't speak Zapotec while, while their parents are speaking Zapotec just uh, right around them. So I think there's sort of a discrepancy in perception there. Um, with all of the other participants, um, parents, I think, were not as cognizant of how much time children spend overhearing Zapotec mm. speech from adults. Um, because again, in those instances, which are less Zapotec dominant households, Speech to children involves a lot of Spanish, but general uh, speech in the environment has a lot of Zapotec in it. 
Okay. So I'm Can, not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess I'm just trying to get a sense of like, are people underreporting or more likely to underreport or overreport, and why that might be? And actually, since uh, oh no, we've got a we've got a question from Helen. Well, I have a follow up for you. We might have to talk about later. Um, but I'll uh, this. Helen says, uh, this is a typical finding with indigenous languages, people under report. This is true for our Quechua Shipibo speakers who mm -hmm. know um, almost only indigenous language, yet they under report their L1 levels uh, and dominance as well. Um, so I guess, you know, in that case, this, since this is relevant, I will go ahead and ask my follow up in our one minute that we have left. Does any of this point to any advice for people that are limited because we can't make these recordings that are going to use self reports, you know, how do we get better, more accurate self reports? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I will say the self reports that I have, I think are following a pretty typical methodology where you ask people sort of hour by hour, what is your child doing? Who are they speaking to? What language are they speaking? What language are they being spoken to? And sort of just like making it more and more precise, I think, is really helpful. Um, and I think, I mean, if I could possibly go down to a lower level of granularity, that might help as well. Um, but I mean, especially with indigenous languages, these questions of ideology are just so big. And also questions of like, what counts as speaking in Zapotec or speaking in Spanish is also, um, there's gonna be a lot of variation there. So I think um, just having these conversations and talking with participants about what their ideas are about, you know, what is Zapotec and what is Spanish can also be insightful. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this was a thank great you. presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and we are going to leave it there and move on to our third presenter of the session. Uh, so welcome to uh, Oksana Laleko from uh, New State, uh, the State University of New York at New Paltz, um, who is uh, gonna take us uh, now to talk about Heritage Russian. So take it away, Oksana. Yes, thank you, Brad. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Well, I would like to start by thanking everyone for being here. And thank you, Brad, for doing such a fantastic job um, at moderating this session. It's a pleasure to be a part of it. And um, I'm very excited that we can do this. <laughs> um, so um, I will go ahead and begin. Um, I hope you can see my presentation in the correct view, the presenter's view uh, in a moment. Yes. So, okay, so I will talk about what order inherited Russian. And uh, if I were to give this talk um, only say three to four years ago, I would have to start it with some kind of a statement that um, word order in heritage languages is um, somewhat an under-researched area in the sense that we don't really know much or anything um, almost about how, you know, things work across uh, a variety of different languages with some individual kind of scattered studies here and there. But I have to say the truth of the matter is that that is no longer the case, is that in the last um, several years, we have actually seen um, an increase in the number of uh, studies, uh, production studies, comprehension studies uh, and experimental work in general, looking at um, information structure in general in, in heritage languages and more specifically looking at how some of these information structural concepts are um, encoded uh, through word order in heritage languages, right? So we actually know um, some things. And um, I would like to start by just outlining where we are in terms of our understanding of word order in heritage language setting. And um, at, at a very basic level, um, just like in any grammatical change or in any grammatical phenomenon, uh, what we might expect uh, to see um, in, um, in the heritage language setting might fall um, under one of those you know, three possible trajectories that I will uh, show you, right? And so in principle, what we can expect in terms of uh, looking at the heritage language uh, compared to the baseline language, we might find in fact that uh, word order in the heritage language is identical or very similar to uh, the word order in the, in the corresponding baseline language and in fact, in fact, um, some of the studies that uh, we have today uh, looking at word order in heritage languages have shown precisely that, that heritage language speakers don't uh, statistically you know, differ or they converge with the controls in terms of how word order is expressed. So that's one possibility. Um, another theoretical possibility is that uh, a, a word order in the heritage language might be more rigid than the corresponding order in the baseline. And 
this is in fact what we see a lot if we take a glance over a, a number of studies. So there has been work on Russian, for example, that has shown a reduction in the use of inversion or VS orders in production, um, and particularly um, in the use of narratives uh, by um, heritage Russian speakers in the United States. Uh, the work of me and my colleague Irina Dubinina um, has shown that um, SVO um, is used much more frequently by heritage language speakers in narratives and other orders are underused relative to SVO. Uh, we have similar results for Spanish, where you know some researchers have shown reduction in the use of non-canonical orders. Uh, shift towards SVO and for Egyptian Arabic has been documented. There's some recent evidence for a reduction in the use of V2 in Norwegian, right? So that there's you know a, a number of uh, a, a growing number of studies pointing in the second direction. But at the same time, uh, there is the possibility that perhaps um, in some circumstances we might even find um, a greater flexibility in the heritage language setting in terms of how word order uh, is expressed and how, uh, what distinctions are expressed to word order. And in fact, there are at least two studies that I'm aware of that point to uh, uh, to a more flexible word order, or at least uh, in, in certain domains. And so one of those studies is a, a, a study of written narratives by uh, Russian speaking adolescents in, in Germany that has actually sho <coughs> shown a greater flexibility in, in the Russian word order, particularly with reference to the final constructions, which may be attributed to the influence of German, where such constructions are present, prevalent, uh, or at least in some contexts. And then they pragmatically get pragma pragmatically unmarked and are used in a wider range of contexts by heritage Russian speakers. Uh, the other study that I'm aware of that has shown a similar result, uh, over acceptance of non-canonical or uh, 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 non-basic constructions was the study uh, on Spanish in the Netherlands. But here, once again, the over acceptance of VS construction likely stems as the authors suggest from the influence of Dutch. Um, if we look at the results overall, um, it looks like, again, at this point, it's too early to really generalize because we seem to have those conflicting results where on the one hand, you know, some speakers or some in some in some context, we see that, uh, for example, you know, end focus or focus marking principles are retained. In other contexts, we, we see some loss of sens sensitivity to focus on heritage speakers. Similarly for Russian, for example, or for, you know, for, um, we have loss of inversion in production, but then we we have over acceptance of inversion in other studies. So I guess uh, one way in which researchers have um, uh, uh, you know, united their efforts in understanding what's happening in the different languages in the different settings is to look at some specific phenomena, specific constructions um, in a specific setting, right? So perhaps if we take a closer look at how um, information and infrastructure expressed through word order in uh, different languages, particularly in languages that make similar distinctions, perhaps we can uh, arrive at a better understanding of what's going on. And so one um, area where we have a lot of work coming together is the expression of focus um, in heritage languages in particular. And um, I, again, I'm looking at this brief summary, this is not an exhaustive list, but once again, we see that even if we narrow our scope down to a specific phenomenon, the answer is still not uh, very clear, right? So for example, is word order sensitive to information structure in particular to the marking of focus? And the answers have ranged, you know, from yes, definitely yes, probably yes, yes, but only in some aspects, in some respects, and probably not, right? And again, I can, um, I'm not going to go through every study, but, you know, the general picture is still, is, is that still we don't really know um, a lot, uh, you know, about what, what is happening. Um, what we do see, though, if we look across some of these studies and try to kind of um, generalize over some of the most common themes, is that one pattern that tends to emerge is that where we do seem to find stronger effects of focus and information structure in general on word order and heritage language setting, uh, usually this uh, result um, shows up in, um, in a situation where a, lang a heritage language um, is kind of better maintained within the speech community. So we have, um, you know, languages like Spanish in the United States, right, a, a language with a large number of speakers, the number one um, heritage language. Uh, or we have um, a situation where heritage language is examined um, in a contact setting where the societally dominant language itself 
um, has a relatively greater flexibility in terms of what order. So there are potential contact effects that might account for perhaps a better retention of some of those constructions in the heritage uh, grammar. Um, you know, whereas we, we tend to find weaker effects um, of information structure on word order uh, that uh, is, in, you know, work on Russian shows that, but again, Russian is not, you know, as um, in terms of the numbers of speakers and over, overall in the sociolinguistic literature, um, it, it usually exhibits a less robust maintenance within the community with more variation along the proficiency scale. Um, as far as the experimental design, a lot, a lot of the Russian studies that have mentioned um, have been based on um, the elicitation of oral narratives, uh, the frog stories and, and similar narratives. And again, uh, such methodology doesn't necessarily target speakers at the highest levels of proficiency because in principle, it doesn't presuppose any literacy in the heritage language. You can elicit a story from basically any uh, speaker with even some rudimentary, some fundamental knowledge of the heritage language. So again, methodology matters in, in terms of what we might find. So there are all these different factors that uh, might be considered. In this particular talk, um, I will focus on um, you know, a very kind of narrow um, uh, 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 area, narrow, narrow question. And the aim um, of this particular study is to look uh, more generally at the effects of information structure and word order in the heritage Russian in, in the United States, but to do it in an experimental setting. Uh, so that would be the first, uh, you know, systematic study of um, uh, the expression of information structure through word order experimentally for Russian specifically using uh, two different uh, methods, using a written and auditory um, contextualized acceptability judgment tasks. Uh, so I will be talking about two of those um, experiments and um, my questions uh, are as follows. So the first global question is, are heritage language speakers sensitive to the same factors as baseline controls in their, as, as baseline speakers in their judgments of object proposing constructions? So in this particular study, and this is an overall larger study that targets multiple orders, but today I will be talking about um, object uh, fronting. So SOV and OSC construction specifically for, for Russian. Uh, my second question uh, is grounded in what we know already for Russian. And so one of the findings is that in production at least, uh, heritage speakers are uh, uh, more sensitive to weight of the moved constituent to the grammatical weight of the moved constituent rather than to its givenness, rather, rather than to its information structural effect. So would we see something similar in um, acceptability judgments um, is the second question. And then the third question, since I'm doing two experiments, the written and the auditory, does the mode of presentation uh, matter? Do we see different results for um, written versus auditory? Um, before I show you the results, um, I would like to say a couple of words about object fronting in Russian and more generally why Russian is a good language um, to look at what order knowledge and heritage bilinguals. Uh, Russian is traditionally described as a free word order language or flexible word order language in which all of the six possibly uh, logically possible um, combinations of the major clausal constituents occur and are grammatical, are acceptable, perhaps in different discourse pragmatic configurations. Um, in terms of frequency, not all orders are created equal. So, and in fact, uh, data uh, shows that spoken Russian and written Russian actually differ significantly in terms of which orders are more or less prevalent. So for spoken Russian, we have SVO and for written Russian as well. So SVO is the most frequent, the basic order, but at the same time in spoken varieties, SOV and OSV orders are, are quite common. Uh, written language favors OVS and OSV. So there's that difference in terms of um, uh, frequency uh, between spoken and written Russian, but crucially, um, the orders are possible. They're not ungrammatical. Uh, for each order, there exists a particular discourse pragmatic configuration in, in which that order would occur and be felicitous. Uh, the distinction uh, among, in the use of all of these constructions that I have here on the screen, largely reflects information structural uh, uh, relations between topic or the encoding of given and or old information and discourse and correspondingly new information and discourse. Um, more specifically, just to show you a couple of examples of the types of constructions that I will be presenting the data for, um, given objects uh, tend to move across the verb to the pre-verbal position. The theoretical motivation is that they need to be excluded from the focus field because Russian, um, as uh, many other languages, does conform to the given 
given before new principle, where given information tends to come before new information. That principle has been shown for a number of languages, not uh, just Russian. So, for example, in a sentence, where is your car for, uh, in Russian, где ваша машина, SVO would work, just the basic order. But in addition to that, the object can occur either um, in the middle or in the beginning, right? So both SOV and OSV orders, машину. Papa machine продал, machine papa продал, literally dad, car sold, car dad sold, uh, all of that works just, just fine. Um, the other consideration um, is object for object proposing, the other factor that has been linked in the literature with this phenomenon concerns uh, the grammatical weight of the object, whether or not the object is a longer the kind of complex constituent or whether it's a shorter, uh, less dense constituent. So pronominal objects, which are, you know, we will term them light objects, tend to move across the verb. And so for that car example, where's your car? So that it sold, it that sold. So these would be the examples of sentences that involve a light object moving across the verb to the sentence initial or the middle position. And once again, cross-linguistically, the principle of you know light constituents occurring before heavy uh, constituents is very well documented and occurs you know arguably universally uh, across languages. So what happens in, in, in Russian and what happens in heritage Russian? Experimentally, even for baseline Russian, there's not a lot of work uh, testing those principles. So a lot of these generalizations come from the theoretical literature. So one of the, I guess, additional advantages of the study is really to see what the uh, native speakers interviewed and tested in Russia do and how they, whether they you know, um, uh, conform to both of these principles uh, in their uh, judgments of object fronting. So in the first experiment, which was presented in the written form, so speakers were looking at sentences on the screen and rating them on the five-point scale, I will be looking at um, SOV, S, uh, SVO, SOV, and OSV constructions in three conditions. So the object is either both new and heavy, which is a full determined phrase. Um, the object is given, um, uh, is given and, and heavy, and the object is given in light. Light is a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal object. So in the experiment, uh, there were 27 question answer pairs. So each uh, target sentence was pre presented in the context, uh, which made it clear whether or not the object was new information or previously presented information. And so first, uh, I will show you what the native speakers uh, do. So the question is, um, are the givenness and um, weight really important in object fronting? And the answer is actually interesting. Um, the answer is yes. But interestingly, OSV and SOV constructions are not um, identical in terms of one is more sensitive to uh, givenness and the other one is more sensitive to weight. So overall, the gener generalizations do hold, but what we see for the Russian controls, and there were 15 speakers in this group, age managed to the heritage speakers that I will talk about later. So we know that for OSV sentences here marked in green, the ratings do um, increase for um, when the construction is given, presented in a given context, here's the only difference that occurs. For SOV constructions, um, givenness uh, or uh, sorry, weight uh, seems to outweigh um, givenness in the sense that the ratings for SOV sentences in, in, in the monolingual data uh, are uh, only reflect this um, distinction between um, heavy and light. Uh, objects. So the light object is more likely to be accepted in the SOV configuration uh, than, than the heavy object for Russia, for, for the baseline data. Uh, another effect that we see in the baseline data is that ratings for the canonical sentences, SVO, actually go down in the context where the object is a pronominal when it's light. So that's kind of an indirect effect of weight. So uh, when SVO, when the object, object is light, then the, uh, that construction doesn't seem as natural, even though SVO is, SVO is a basic order in Russian, but it's, it's not as natural as when the, uh, the object is, is heavy. Uh, so what do the heritage language speakers do? And um, I have I have a, a table here with information. I don't want to spend time going over it, but I just tell you that the uh, the profile of, of a typical heritage language speaker in the study is very similar to what we see in the literature, right? So er early naturalistic bilinguals, age of arrival between zero and seven, before puberty, right? So all the typical characteristics of, you know, what we consider a heritage language speaker um, holding the data. And so what we see for um, heritage Russian, is that in terms of, um, first of all, in terms of, um, let me just move my, um, 
I'm just moving the uh, uh, video away so I can see the graph. Um, so the ratings for um, OSV construction, so there is no effect of um, givenness. Uh, so the same statistical difference that we saw in the monolinguals is not showing up for heritage language speakers. And then similarly for uh, for the um, SOV constructions based on weight, that's, that was the other con uh, contrast that was significant. We don't really see it in the heritage data. So uh, what we do see though is we do see that same reduction in the ratings uh, for the SVO for the canonical construction. So I take this as evidence that there's some something with weight going on, right? So SVO sentences, I mean, that little difference does come out as significant, suggesting that um, object weight does matter, you know, at least in the condition for the canonical sentences. So basically everything I've just said is summarized here in these slides, right? So the monolinguals as predicted do show uh, effects of both givenness and weight in their ratings of object proposing, uh, but for heritage language speakers, the result in the written test as not as straightforward in the sense that the only kind of effect of weight that we see has to do with the ratings of SVO sentences, but there's something, you know, there, there's some effects there. Um, what happens in if we pre, pre, um, introduce or present our sentences in an auditory format? So that was the question that I was kind of curious about. And the reason for that, I guess there are two reasons why I felt that uh, there might be a difference there. And um, again, I was starting with the existing literature on heritage Russian, where basically, you know, the German study, um, the Russian in Germany, that was a study of written narratives, right? So for written narratives, you can't really manipulate prosody. We don't know um, how the speakers um, uh, contour their sentences when they when they process them, right? So we don't really have any information. So we need to have some data for Russian that involves, you know, some kind of an auditory uh, presentation. So. And, and the two reasons to think that there might be a difference is first, well, auditory presentation certainly gives you access to prosodic cues. And we know that in Slavic languages in general, in Russian in particular, information structure marking is very strongly associated with prosody. And so word order is not the only way to mark information structural distinctions, but a combination of prosody and information in, in word order um, accomplishes um, these results. Uh, a second reason is that in generally an auditory experiment um, brings us closer to a setting uh, where the language resembles the spoken language that heritage speakers would be exposed to in their everyday life. So both of these factors, uh, you know, the availability of prosodic cues, as well as the presentation mode that is more net closer to the spoken registers, both of these factors would predict a more nuanced recognition, maybe new, more nuanced ratings in the heritage speaker group, uh, because heritage speakers are, of course, the early naturalistic uh, bilinguals who would... Uh, you know, while, you know, being exposed to the language in their early stages of development, who would, you know, have been exposed to, to those prosodic cues in their acquisition of word orders. So in this experiment, I'm not dealing with weight. Uh, we have already determined that there are some effects of weight in the, in the heritage data. So at this point, I'm only looking at givenness. And so we're looking at, again, the same structures, SVO, SOV, OSV constructions, uh, but now speakers can hear them. Um, 20 participants from the larger uh, group participated in this uh, study. The profile is very similar. Uh, so I only have a few minutes, but I want to talk about the difference between the uh, written and auditory tests. And so one immediate result is we can see that not just for the heritage speakers, but for everybody, for the monolinguals as well, across the board, the non-canonical constructions become more acceptable. Right, so that's kind of what we expect: is that non-canonical constructions are perhaps more common in, in, in colloquial registers, but also prosodically, uh, they are easier to accept uh, for not only for heritage language speakers, but also for uh, for the L1s for the for the controls. So that's kind of an interesting um, comparison. If we just look at the auditory test, and I keep saying auditory, I mean, I have to say it was a bimodeled test. I mean, the speakers could still see the sentences. They were still presented on the screen, but the idea is that the, uh, they could also hear them. They could also take advantage of the prosodic cues. Um, I call it auditory for convenience. Uh, so interestingly for, uh, you know, when the object was uh, new in the object new condition. So in this condition, there were 
no differences at all between the um, monolinguals and the heritage speakers. So in, on, across the group comparisons, uh, the ratings were exactly the same and that both groups um, recognized um, OSV as the less acceptable order than um, SVO when the object was new, right? So that recognition was there in, in both groups. The, the difference between the OS, um, OSV and SVO conditions turned out significant. Um, if we look at conditions where the object was given um, in the context, once again, same pattern of improvement um, in the acceptability of non-canonical construction for the L1 and heritage. So for both groups, auditory presentation matters. What we do see in terms of difference is that heritage language speakers did underrate the OSV um, sentences. Uh, so that significant that difference between the heritage and the monolingual speakers turned out as significant. But the good news is that uh, the SVO, but even an SOV, the non-canonical SOV, were the same across the two groups uh, in the auditory uh, experiment. In fact, if we look back at the ratings from the first, you know, from the written tasks in the heritage language, and if we just look at the numerical ratings that they were provided, providing, not the effects of giving this in it, but you know, how what did how did they rate OSV constructions? Um, I'm sorry, SOV constructions, we actually see higher ratings for SOV in the heritage language group, which goes against the prediction that. Um, heritage languages are always more rigid than baseline languages in terms of word order, right? So in that sense, if anything, um, in the auditory experiment, heritage language speakers converge with the monolinguals on SOV. In the written experiment, they actually over accept it, right? So there is that expansion in the range of context for SOV in the heritage group. So bringing this whole thing back um, to our initial questions, um, are heritage speakers sensitive to the same factors as baseline speakers in rating object proposals? Posing. Somewhat, I'm willing to say, you know, it's not a no. It's not a hard no in the sense that they're partially sensitive to weight, which is a result that shows up in their uh, reduced ratings of SVO constructions with light objects. Uh, but they don't seem to be equally sens sensitive to givenness, at least in the written task. Um, what is that in line with what we know about production? It does seem to be in line because in the production study that we did with Irina Dubinina, we also found that whenever heritage speakers used um, kind of dislocation or, you know, um, uh, uh, object proposal then it was more likely to be with light constituents rather than with given constituents. So weight was kind of more, um, uh, more important uh, in, in that context in production. So in judgments, we kind of see a sim similar pattern. And then does experiment modality matter? And the answer to that is, is yes. Uh, so definitely it does matter. So heritage language speakers nearly converge with the controls in in the bimodal experiment where they could take uh, advantage of auditory representation, which, boosted, which boosts acceptability of non-canonical constructions, not only in the heritage group, but also for the monolinguals. Um, so what have we learned and what are the implications? Well, uh, bringing, bringing us back to some of the existing studies and the discussions that are happening right now in terms of uh, what, what, uh, what order change uh, means in the heritage language setting, um, there's some discussion in the literature about whether any changes that we observe, whether those changes reflect um, kind of representational differences between the heritage grammar and the corresponding baseline grammar, or perhaps maybe we're dealing with some processing effects um, in the heritage language. And I know that Brad's work, for example, speaks to that um, in, in relation to Spanish. I'm not citing it here, but I do acknowledge that you, I, I, I am aware of your very interesting studies in, in this area. Um, but so it, so based on, on this study, we can't answer this question directly, but I suggest that uh, we can perhaps hint at the possibility that the fact that there is a difference between auditory and written is that we are probably not dealing with representational issues. So perhaps, you know, once, uh, since the acceptability of non-canonical orders does go up in the auditory setting, then perhaps prosody helps. And that means that not all is lost, right? So there's something that can be helped by, uh, you know, presenting the sentences in, in a different context. And in fact, uh, uh, some recent work on the loss of V2, or at least reduction of V2 orders in heritage Norwegian, um, there is a discussion towards the end of that of that paper. I'm talking about Marit Westergaard's and Terry Long, London's uh, study uh, that that makes kind of a similar point. Is that what they observe, uh, which they are not looking at information structure specifically. They're looking at kind of syntactic change, but they are making a case that it's probably not representational because 
what they're seeing is a reduction in the pragmatic context in which you know v2 is acceptable in Norwegian, Norwegian. and so those pragmatic changes um, you know then eventually trigger you know grammatical changes but it's not clear that in their participant sample that the changes are representational so perhaps it's just lack of access to the relevant constructions um, the other way in which this study can kind of inform the existing discussions and, and, and debates is that it actually shows that we don't see this across, across the board uh, rigidification in the use of um, word order, word order flexible word order constructions. And that goes against some of the claims made by, you know, some hypotheses, such as the interface hypothesis. You know, I'm going to go in, in depth. I assume that some, you know, people would know what I mean, and we can come back to this in the, in the, in the discussion. But um, we don't see this across the board reduction in the acceptability of all orders uh, that are pragmatically uh, induced, right? Uh, we, in fact, what we do see is that we see convergence, uh, convergence between heritage and monolingual speakers on SVO stru SOV structures. And in fact, we even see their strengthening uh, in the written experiment in the heritage speaker judgment. And um, the, the reason that I really like that result is, is that it was interesting because it's actually the first study to my knowledge that, sh that showed a strengthening of some non-basic or non-canonical order in the heritage language setting that wasn't obviously contact induced. Because again, if we look at the previous studies in that third uh, scenario that I talked about in the beginning, uh, there was a study on heritage Russian in Germany that showed um, increase in V2, but German does that, right? So again, we can attribute this to, to contact induced effect. Uh, the study of Spanish in the Netherlands, again, because of how focus is marked in Dutch, uh, we can talk about uh, contact you know, um, effect. There is no OV in American English. Right, so American English doesn't do SOV. So the fact that, that that order is quite robust in the heritage speaker group, and in fact, it's ra rated even higher than in the monolingual group in some context, uh, uh, prompts further um, investigation of, of, um, of factors that might be responsible for that. And of course, obvious an obvious place to look is input, right? So what do heritage speakers get? What do they hear? Um, and while um, we don't really have at this point a comprehensive corpus of uh, data on immigrant Russian or what, you know, what the parents of these speakers would do. We do know from work on colloquial varieties of Russian in, in Russia, for example, that SOV happens to be on the rise, that it is kind of becoming a, a feature of colloquial Russian and that the uh, frequency of SOV is going up. And so perhaps, you know, we're dealing with one of those situations where changes happening in the heritage language actually mirror, you know, some of the changes already happening in the baseline as well. Uh, there's also a, um, an argument. Sana, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I we're running out of time here, well, so I think we'll need to wrap it up. Okay, uh, and of course, and so um, with that, and we, we should also look at the universal tendencies because SOV waters, you know, have been argued to be um, universal. So with that, I conclude my presentation. I um, I am very grateful for for uh, for Brad's um, helpful um, hint, and I am happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Oksana. Um, as I mentioned, I think we are basically out of time for this session. So anybody who oh. wants to stick around um, and ask a question, a couple of questions of Oksana, um, let's. Uh, I hope Blake, uh, you can confirm for me. Will this room stay open for a minute? Um, because I know there's. I see there's at least one question. Uh, Blake says yeah. the room will stay open for a minute. So I know yeah. that some people will need to go, um, in which case, thank you for joining us for this session. Um, mm -hmm. I also know there is a keynote, I think, in about 15 minutes. Um, so just putting that uh, on people's radars. But for those who want to uh, hang out, I'm happy to hang out and moderate um, a few mm -hmm. questions here. Um, so, uh, Sophia, you mentioned that you had a question. Do you want to go ahead and uh, put that in the chat for us? Um, or if you'd like, um, I'm not sure you have the ability to unmute yourself, um, but if you can go for it, I guess. Ah, there we go. So, um, oh, uh, I have the ability to unmute you. All right, Sophia, um, can you raise your hand? Actually, hold on, I'll just get there. Uh, and I see Stefan's question as well. So, um, Sophia, um, has raised her hand. One moment. And I can speak. Wonderful. Hi, Sophia. Wow. Good Hi. to hear you. Great, great to see you. Thank you for the for the very interesting talk. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, 
it's mostly a clarification question. Yeah. Um, could you, if you could show the, the auditory uh, results slide again, um, that, that might be helpful for me. Um, I, uh, just to, to summarize, so were there uh, effects of newness or givenness in the auditory presentation of the data or, or not? Because I, I mean, I, I saw the under use um, of, the, of the object initial order. Yeah. So the interesting, yeah, the interesting, but, the interesting finding about the, the auditor presentation was that uh, there was really so both the, all, both types of uh, constructions were okay uh, with both types of reading, which brings us to the question of prosody and how uh, prosodically. Uh, so the position of the object uh, when. Um, in, so, so both new and given objects can occur in a post-verbal and, and a pre-verbal position in Russian. And so the idea is right. that uh, we did not see any difference in the rating. So all of the constructions were acceptable. So I'll, I'll find that uh, slide. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah thank yeah. you. Yeah, yep. That's what I mm -hmm. thought, but it mm -hmm. wasn't... It wasn't yes. something that, that was highlighted. Yeah, and, my, and my story for that, and again, this is some, somewhere where we need to do more work because in, my story for that is that again, with, uh, you know, when prosody comes into, into effect, so then when we just look at the word order, right? That that's what we have. Uh, mm -hmm. When we have prosody on top of it, now we are, um, there's more flexibility in terms of word order. So for example, if something is given, we can uh, mark given this by movement or we can mark it prosodically, right? So, but the idea is that both heritage and native speakers recognize that um, you can do it both ways. So, yeah, so for that, um, I don't have that, I didn't do the slide, but yeah, the ratings were all very high for both. Sounds great, thank you. Thank you, Sophia. The other question that came in was from Stefan Pofristik uh, from the University of Pennsylvania, who asks uh, something that I was also wondering, which is, have you seen any interaction between the heritage speaker's knowledge or use of case marking in their Russian and the word orders that they use? I haven't. I, this is a wonderful question. In fact, I had to uh, skip over my last slide where this was listed explicitly as, one, as, as a question for future work. And the reason for that is that we know from typological research is that SOV languages tend to be case languages. Uh, so, you know, between the SOV and the SVO, so one prediction of that is that if we actually claim that, you know, newer languages, you know, develop the words SOV, so the prediction would be that within the heritage group, uh, speakers who have a stronger control of the case system, and Russian does have a complicated, you know, six case system, those speakers would probably be um, even more accepting of SOV orders. And those speakers who perhaps show some uh, signs of um, restructuring within the case system, which you know independently worked by Maria Polinsky and others have shown that that's happening in Russian as well as in other languages in Polish. Uh, the prediction would be that speakers whose case system is not as um, uh, retained, I guess, to, to, the, uh, to, to, to the same extent would perhaps not show that same preference for SOV. So that's definitely a very good question and a great direction for, for a future study. Um, yeah, I was I was wondering the exact same thing because I know about that. I'm I'm familiar with that work that has the case systems being reduced by a lot of heritage speakers. So I was wondering what role that would take. Um, all right. Well, those are the two questions that came in. And since we're already over time, I'm going to call it there. Um, so thank you to everybody for uh, for coming today. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference, uh, this afternoon's keynote and uh, everything else uh, here at the LSA. Thank you again to all, to all of our presenters. I know Julia had to leave, but thank you, Oksana and your Denise. Um, and uh, I hope everybody has a lovely Saturday. Thank you. I just wanted Sarah to also mention that well. uh, if anybody wants to work with a, with a grammatically marked corpus of Russian, we can uh, now begin to share data from the Birch corpus, which has malilingual and bilingual components. Cool. Oh, congratulations, Sophia. That's great to hear. We're I've been looking the, forward the, to the that. First, the you. first part is ready to be shared. It's not syntactically parsed yet, but it's morphologically tagged. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, yep. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, and uh, have a lovely rest of the conference. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Brad.